GRU Division P. The SCP Foundation is generally considered a global organization, with agents and facilities across the world, but by and large they are headquartered in the United States. They don't usually have any special affiliations or bonds with the US government, but most of their larger sites are in America. There are plenty of other anomalous organizations around the world though that do share special connections to different countries and governments. The FBI has an unusual incidents unit, the GOC works for the United Nations, and GRU Division P is an official branch of the Russian Armed Forces. Division P will give us a couple of unique perspectives to look into, one of course them being Russian, and the other of an anomalous organization that works directly for a country's government. Division P has been involved in a large number of anomalies since their inception, and so we'll only be looking at the more notable ones. The GRU is an actual foreign military intelligence agency that serves the Russian armed forces, responsible for gathering intelligence on foreign countries and ensuring Russia's security, partly by utilizing an elite group of special forces known as the Spetsnaz GRU. Division P of the GRU, or Division Psychotronics, was supposedly formed after Stalin commanded a small group of men to investigate the death of Bolshevik leader Sergei Kirov. The history books show that Kirov was simply assassinated at gunpoint, but Stalin suspected there was more to it, and sure enough, it was later proved that Kirov was murdered using a Construct Invasive Reality Discrepancy. At a meeting with the investigators and other officials, Stalin announced that Kirov's murderer had used a small trinket to walk up and kill him without a single guard stopping him. The investigation fueled Stalin's paranoia, and the group, then known as the Abnormal Occurrences Commission, continued looking into various anomalies mostly for their potential benefit to the Soviet Union. As they learned of the state of anomalies present in the world, and how much further along other countries were in paranatural research, particularly Germany, the group was expanded into an official division of the GRU. The Foundation doesn't know much about Division P's activities during their height, other than they had been working on plenty of projects utilizing anomalies to ensure the Soviet security as a superpower. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, however, Division P was supposedly dissolved along with it, although many former members continued to collaborate in secret. We'll mostly be looking at anomalies handled by Division P during their height, between the 1940s and 1980s. Division P, during their operating years, of course kept tabs on a number of other anomalous organizations across the world. The Foundation, referred to internally as SAC was largely a mystery to Division P, but they knew they were rapidly expanding in scope. The Horizon Initiative, referred to as Bulava, is an anomalous organization based on the three major Abrahamic religions, and became staunch enemies of the Church of the Broken God and the Fifth Church. Division P would apparently occasionally cooperate with the Foundation and the Horizon Initiative to prevent the spread of hogweed at all costs although exactly what hogweed is, is left as a mystery. Division P would screen their cosmonaut applicants for any fifthist beliefs, and would cooperate with another secretive Soviet organization referred to as Engels, to use anomalies to improve the USSR. Let's start then with a particularly Soviet anomaly, SCP-1011, a two meter tall iron statue depicting a worker whose head has been replaced with various tools. At the base of the statue is an inscription reading, Man is the most important means of production. 1011 came to the attention of the Foundation in 1947 after an inspection by the Soviet government to look into a steelworks that was consistently exceeding their production targets. 1011's properties activate after being seen by a human subject, who goes on to perform productive labor no more than three hours later. The subjects are now in stage one of the exposure, and although intervention can halt the progress of the condition, subjects will continue to expose themselves to 1011 if left unchecked. 
Stage 1 subjects will begin to demonstrate a heightened sense of morale and satisfaction, working longer hours voluntarily and becoming more focused on their tasks. This stage lasts for months, and as time goes on, subjects will cease any activity other than working, sleeping, and taking care of basic needs. Eventually, subjects will progress to stage 2, where they will begin to disregard their personal safety, choosing not to use things such as helmets, gloves, or safety glasses, claiming that they are unnecessary and binding. They will also slowly cease to utilize tools in their work, instead using their own bodies, even at the risk of minor damage. A number of months later, they will progress to stage 3, where subjects will no longer sleep, instead staring at the statue for an average of 3 hours per day. The use of tools and machines is almost completely abandoned by this point, as subjects will work in groups to accomplish tasks, and their bodies begin to deform to better aid them. They also have developed a marked resistance to pain, casually using their bodies to perform horrifically dangerous tasks. The investigator who inspected the steelworks in 1947 found that men were handling red-hot ingots with their bare hands, which were black and shriveled. Others pounded in rivets with their heads, and he saw two men using another man to saw through a log, the man's back covered in sharp ridges. Each worker smiled eagerly at every visitor, and they would extol the glorious virtues of the statue. The inspector requested the immediate shutdown of the steelworks, claiming that this is not the path they should be taking to rebuild the motherland. It's at this point then that the foundation became aware of the statue and moved in to secure it, but Division P arrived first, sealing off the area. A leaked action report from Division P showed that they found the steelworks abandoned, with dozens of ingots sitting in the main foundry. Inspection of the ingots revealed that the last 15 had a distinct texture, softer than normal, with bone-like segments interspersed. Inspection of the furnace revealed remains of blood and scraps of tissue inside. They found one worker alive, who ignored all questions and would only repeat, jobs done, over and over. It seems that stage 4 of exposure causes subjects to use their own bodies as construction material. Division P apparently left the statue where it was, as in 1991 the foundation managed to buy the steelworks and convert it into a site. So far, they have not had any luck in finding the trigger for D-class subjects to progress from stage 3 to stage 4. Perhaps they just don't possess that communist spirit. Let's move on to something that tells us a bit more about Division P, while also being a really interesting SCP. SCP-3034 is a recurring radio broadcast that so far has only been picked up in a remote area of Russia, and all attempts to trace the broadcast's origins have failed. It was first brought to the Foundation's attention by a defecting agent of Division P, and he directed them to a remote facility in Russia first believed by the Foundation to be a Russian number station. Number stations are radio stations that have been utilized by various countries dating back to World War I to transmit encrypted information to agents operating in foreign countries through the use of vocalized, repeating numbers. They found the station recently evacuated, with a still-running generator, well-maintained radio equipment, burnt records, and dozens of logbooks describing received broadcasts dating back to 1947. Carved into a desk in Russian, they found two phrases, do not let her finish, and tell her all is well. On their second day there, an alarm in the station went off, signaled by an incoming broadcast. Turning on the speakers, the Foundation agents heard a young woman speaking in Russian, counting down. The agents quickly decided to follow the instructions on the desk, turned on the microphone, and said, Sio Krusho, or All is Well. The voice stopped, a tone played, and the broadcast ended. It would seem that, at random intervals, sometimes as short as two weeks apart, or as long as six months, the station will receive a broadcast, 
in which a synthesized musical tone will play, followed by the voice of the young girl counting down from 200 in Russian. The broadcast is stopped only by an individual transmitting all is well, and so far the Foundation is unwilling to see what happens when the voice gets to zero. A partially burned magnetic tape reveals a conversation recorded between two Division P agents. The conversation concerns a young girl that one of the agents apparently attempted to take away from Division P, possibly with the intention to run away to America. The agent in charge insists that the girl is state property, and that the other agent is delusional if he thought he would get to raise the girl as his own. The captured agent says that Division P is messing with powers they can't possibly understand, but the other agent says that the Americans are potentially forcing their hand, referring to something as an atom bomb. The captured agent says that one does not make deals with atom bombs, nor does one sacrifice little girls to them. The agent says that these sacrifices will save millions, if not billions. The ends justify the means, as always. He says that they will demonstrate their power to the Americans with a small taste of what they can do with this atom bomb. The captured agent panics, saying that they cannot go through with this, as they have finally contained this entity, and they can't risk it by making deals with it. They seem to each be suffering from nightmares, voices screaming in the dark. The agent in charge concludes that if America forces their hand, they'll do whatever it takes. The Foundation determines that the broadcasts are each unique occurrences of a young girl counting down, not the same recording over and over. There's also significant audio distortion in the background of each broadcast, but the distortion is too weak for them to analyze. They learn that the longer the broadcast goes on, the stronger the distortion becomes and they decide to let the counting continue for longer than usual to learn more. After listening to the broadcast countdown to 50 a few times, they determine that the distortion is in fact the sounds of thousands of thousands of children screaming. At one point, a researcher stationed at the site attempted an unauthorized experiment, trying to communicate with the voice during a broadcast. The voice immediately stopped counting, and the broadcast changed to a high-pitched screeching sound, inflicting significant levels of pain, dizziness, and disorientation to all personnel present. This continued for 25 seconds until the researcher transmitted all is well, causing the broadcast to cease. Afterwards, researchers noted a significant increase in missing children cases around the world, the majority of them occurring apparently during that 25 second period they all remain unsolved. The next broadcast occurred two weeks later, with the audio distortion in the background much louder than normal, and the counting starting at 199. So, as expected, Division P will go to great lengths to secure Russia's future, up to and including consorting with powerful ancient entities that demand children's sacrifices. Let's hope that countdown never reaches zero then. Division P dabbled with many different ways of winning the Cold War beyond making sacrificial deals with devils, including using SCP-2762. 2762 is a small stone carved into the shape of a snake weaving over itself, with its head resting on top. The stone seems to be around 500 years old and is covered in carved runes that were apparently added later. Overall, the stone is similar in appearance to other sculptures associated with ancient Mesoamerican cultures. Every full moon, 2762 will activate, vibrating and glowing green, as it draws in all nearby matter through anomalous means. This vacuum effect intensifies until 10 cubic meters of non-gaseous matter is consumed by the stone, at which point the consumed matter is disgorged in the form of large, animate snakes through a portal. This portal always opens in a space near the current President of the United States. The snakes, approximately 17 meters in length, 
and composed of the material consumed by the stone will attempt to kill and consume the president, if not destroyed first. They will also lose all anomalous properties at the following dawn. Obviously, this is a pretty big problem for the US government, but it's unclear if any president was actually killed due to 2762. The US Secret Service attempted to negate the stone's effects by sending it to the moon, believing that since it activates based on the phases of the moon, if it was on the moon's surface, it wouldn't be able to activate. Unfortunately, 2762 uses the target's location to determine the moon phases, not itself. So the activations continued, and the foundation has been unable to find it in the moon to retrieve it. As expected, the foundation was able to trace the stone's creation back to GRU Division P, and track down a former agent living in America. A foundation doctor interviewed the man in a coffee shop to find out more about the stone. The stone was found by the GRU in Mexico, in the hands of some revolutionaries who planned on using it to topple Mexico's government and install a true communist regime. Back then, all the stone did was pull in a small amount of matter and spit out a small snake from the mouth of the stone. Not very useful but the GRU intervened before learning if they had intended to modify the stone themselves to make it stronger. It had likely started out as part of some ritual for an Aztec deity. Division P got a hold of the stone and began modifying it by carving runes into its surface, making it far more powerful and the snakes far more aggressive than before. They also moved the portal it created from the mouth of the stone to a spot near the President of America. They also included some runes to protect the stone if it was ever captured by the Americans, which it was. The former agent finishes the conversation by asking that if they do end up retrieving the stone from the moon, to bring it to him so he can remove its protections. He says that when they first modified it, they were young and idealistic, hoping to win the Cold War themselves. Now he realizes that the president being eaten by a giant moon snake would be more trouble than it's worth. That definitely wasn't the end of Division P's attempts to destabilize the West through the use of anomalies. SCP-4848 is a mimetic hazard consisting of a phrase spread through visual and auditory means created by Division P. The phrase causes individuals to become preoccupied with it incorporating it into their work routines and projects, but the phrase has no clear definition and is interpreted differently by different people, causing the general work processes of a facility to slow down. This effect is seen most prominently in the armament industry, and was spread by Division P as Project Termite to make the American military-industrial complex far less efficient. They also apparently used some sort of extra-dimensional portal to create infinite amounts of ships that they proceeded to salvage and sell off to fund their projects, as seen in SCP-2577. They also made a mimetic hazard that eventually causes people to explode and expel bald eagles and Big Macs, SCP-1681. GRU Division P is in some ways similar to the FBI's UIU, generally in over their heads with the forces they're meddling with. Division P differs of course in their operational goals, being far more ruthless and determined to do whatever it takes for the USSR. Obviously, in the end, their use of anomalies couldn't prevent their own dissolution and the collapse of the Soviet Union, which isn't that surprising. There are former agents still kicking around though, some still with an extreme loyalty to the Soviet Union and the knowledge of countless anomalies. There's plenty more to be read about GRU Division P and their shady antics during the Cold War, but this should have given you a decent first look at another unique and patriotic group of interest.